All right, I'm feeling the progress. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Carousel Podcast. Okay, now I have to ask you, and this is probably the dumbest, not the dumbest thing I will ask you tonight, but um, is the Carousel, I'm assuming, based on the Don Draper masterpiece? Yes, that's exactly Okay, right. great. Based on the... It's based on it's uh it's based on two things. It's based on one uh the Don Draper speech at the end of season one of Mad Men, and then two it's based on um a Towns Van Zant song Miss Carousel. Cool. Uh, which has an amazing line in it uh, that goes something like, "I wish I had it in front of me," but the natural man cannot stand. Uh, on the velvet beneath re- on the velvet beach beneath the reach the natural man has fallen you own his legs but his mind is free how long will he be crawling wow <laughs> and it's pretty the cool. whole thing is about miss carousel like it's a, it's a fucking great uh, how do we feel about the uh i believe it's rogers and hammerstein the the, the musical uh of, of what carousel oh carousel dark That's americana Oh, well, that may be worth it. I'm not gay, so I've never seen any. Oh, snap. (laughs) (laughs) That may be worth a whole pot unto itself. Well, it's very American. Yeah. Say that. Yeah. No, American is Coca Cola. Mm. To which Uh, we're drinking some Coke. It's got some, I mean, this is real Americana. Yeah. These are like, they're not even Diet Cokes. These are Coke Cokes. Like, not even Coke Zero. This is. Yeah. Regular sugar. Good old fashioned, right? Mm. So this is Matthew David Wilder. Yes, sir. Director, writer, extraordinaire. I think probably best well known for the Paul Schrader film. I wrote a film uh, that was directed by Paul Schrader called Dog Eat Dog. Dog Eat Dog. Which stars Nick Cage and Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Um, I'm about to direct a movie this summer called uh, One More Sleepless Night with the brilliant rainy quality well, everybody out there hot see yeah smoking hot. oh she's of course she's in the um a, a movie you just talked about right uh uh what's it called um bolt driver bolt, bolt driver right uh well you'll see her in a whole different light in this movie and jonathan reese myers who we who we love a uh, brilliant irish um, where's actor. he been at he's doing a million movies you just haven't seen them yeah uh i just saw him in a friend's movie uh a vietnam movie called ambush where he plays a Southern dude who raised hounds and got sent to Vietnam and found people, found like stray uh, soldiers using his dogs. Now, this is not the kind of, this kind of redneck role is not what you would associate with Jonathan Reese Myers of Match Point, but he's fantastic in the movie. He's perfect. Yeah, yeah I mean, you couldn't ask for better. Yeah. Uh, so he's a man with a great range. He's a good actor. He's a good actor. I liked him. I loved Matchpoint, of course. Uh, and what else was he in? He was in uh, Mike. Uh, Mike Hodges did some great movies like uh, "I'll Sleep When I'm Dead" with Clive Owen yeah. and Croupier. Uh, he was in those. He's been in all. He's been in all kinds of you know all sorts of things. He's a young man, but he's done a lot in That's his awesome. in his young time. Yeah. So it's a it's a um, it's a uh, very sober, very adult. Um, horror movie that's being shot in Bangkok in Thailand. By Bangkok in Thailand. Uh, by Bangkok in Thailand. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's 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 a thing. I mean, the thing that's interesting to me about this movie is it's it's a genre that somehow right now is completely overlooked, which is adult horror. Um, adult movies horror. like The Hunger, you know, with yeah. David Bowie and, and, and Catherine Deneuve, or Don't Look Now, you know, with Donald Sutherland and Julie Christie, those kind of movies that were about adult, sexual, married people, grown ups. What about Antichrist? Lives. Antichrist, fantastic yeah. movie. I always thought it was a real shame that IFC didn't go to town and sell Antichrist as like a horror movie, like an A twenty four horror movie. It would have made, would have cleaned up. Uh, maybe they were too afraid of it or something. Well, A twenty four would have screwed it up, right? I mean, they wouldn't have let it be what it was just saying ifc just released yeah. it like oh it's a lars von Trier movie and they right. missed i think a whole audience that would have loved that movie because yeah. it's a fucking scary horror movie yeah yeah no and it's, yeah, uh, it's well done i think you know i really like ari aster's movies but i think they are in a way they're like 
still kind of teen movies. This is hereditary. Hereditary and, and mid Midsummer. Both of those movies to me have incredible first acts, like 10 out of 10 first acts, both of those movies, just the terror and the interpersonal terror, you know, like in, uh, in um, uh, hereditary or no, sorry, it's in Midsommar that fear you have when somebody doesn't call you back like a family member that you're like playing in your head like they killed themselves they killed themselves you know like you people we can all relate to that fear of like the unstable person we know like when they don't call you back for me it's my mother uh yeah. then you must love it yeah, 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 yeah. uh you know like that fear and seeing that borne out in the way that it was Whew. but then it falls apart then to me it's like the well, rest of the movie is just like nothing happens to it's me the rest like, of it is like it's a bit like it's sort of a rehash of get out where you go to this place where the whitest people in the yeah. world yeah. turn out to be oh my god the yeah. scariest yeah. people in the world <laughs> look at them they're blonde and they have white blouses on but they're the scariest people in the world the most violent people on earth yeah. and i thought that was just so um kind of playing into the moment yeah that sort of it was that moment it was the, i think it was even pre yeah it was pre um george floyd but it was very like white self-flagellating kind of you know yeah. uh, 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 movie and it was like it was like you know what would, it was like he's being there like you know what would be crazy to do a horror movie when it's light outside like th that's clearly like terrible. what the idea was and it's like all right terrible that's he, a good idea for a commercial not an entire movie. well i think one movie does that very well which is um the Coen Brothers, not the TV show, but the original movie, Fargo, is a is a white noir in both senses yeah. of the word. Right. It's yeah. blindingly white uh, uh, yeah, in yeah, all yeah. senses of the word. And it totally works. And yeah. it somehow takes all the conventions of noir, puts them in this super bland universe, and it's more weird and more disturbing and yeah. scary than ever, I think. Totally. Totally. I think that's a great film. It really is. Okay, so let's talk about your path to uh, Hollywood. Ah. Where Where are you from? Where What was your childhood like? And how did you become a writer? Well, it's a. Or were you a director first? I was a director first. Okay. I I grew up in a uh, for people who know Chicago at all. I grew up in a trailer park in Des Plaines, Illinois, and this this trailer park was so gnarly, it makes Eminem's trailer park look like Downton Abbey. It was really rough shit. Uh, and if you ever are passing through Chicago and you're in the O'Hare airport and you look out the people mover out the window, if there's a window out on the outside, you'll see this no man's land that is Des Plaines, Illinois. Uh, and that's, that's where I grew up. My dad was a truck driver. Um, my mom was a, after, later on became a teacher. Um, but it was, you know, the, my, my upbringing there gave me, I think, a, a unique perspective on things, particularly on our identity politics moment, which is I lived in a place that really had no identity. And I think there are a lot of people in America who, who, who live in and grew up in places like this, where it's, it's as if you're a baby that grew up in a five mile wide 7-Eleven. You know, everything around you is fluorescent lights and, and, and hostess fruit pies, maybe, Mountain Dew, but there's no indigenous stuff. You don't belong to a place. The place that you're in could be in Des Plaines, Illinois, or it could be in South Dakota, or it could be in Mississippi or way or wherever. You're there's a few big boxes around you. You know, there's some retail universe around you, but there's not really a location and there's not really a specific identity. So when America became very identitarian, it was very weird to me because I was like, wow, well, this is. To me, the most American thing of all is this place that is just purely um, mercantile. It's it's a place that has it just has no identity. It deliberately is robbed of of identity. Um, so that was you know where where I grew up, and I went to uh, I went to college uh, at Yale in the eighties, which I think we talked about this a little bit. My so that uh, was that must have been a rough. Transition? Transition from Trailer Park to Yale. Oh, it was fantastic. It was Trailer fantastic. Park to Yale. I had it was fantastic. I had uh cool, you know, young women from the city who took me to a place where you eat raw fish with sticks, and I had never seen that before. And, you know, <laughs> well, how did you like, figure that out? I mean, how did you how did here make sure to stay close to the mic? I'm, uh I'm here, we can move it close to it. But uh um, how did you figure that out? I mean, being from a trailer park, you know, like how did you figure out how to 
get to you. I mean, I would have been completely, I would have been a drug dealer if, if it was me. You would have been a drug dealer. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I come from a family that has no, I come from like a family that has no infrastructure at all uh, in my immediate family, my extended family, you know, I, I'm half Jew, half wasp. It's very uh, classic and the best half and half end of half. empire on both sides. Great. So it's like the, you know, the fail children of that. You're going to It's fantastic. Yeah, right? It's not bad. But um, anyway, I had no infrastructure. And instead of like figuring it out, I spent a very long time. Uh, I mean, you know, I went to, I guess I did kind of figure it out, but I, I just would have never been able to figure out how to go to Yale. I mean, like, how did you figure that out? Well, I was, you know, uh, not to wax my own car, but when from a young age, I was in like, you know, uh, a smart drama. Was it like drama? No, no, just like advanced classes and stuff like that. And I went to a school that, uh, God bless their little hearts. I think they're actually, I think the school that I went to is actually doing good stuff now. But when I was there, they kind of postured as being a, a, a Midwestern version of like a prep school, like Andover or something like that. So were your parents, what were your parents like? Were they, what about them? Were they? My dad was, my dad was a truck driver. He was gone. He split when I was seven. Oh, okay. My mom remarried later uh, to a guy who was a sort of a hospital bureaucrat. Mm. We live with my grandparents, very ghetto experience, you know, living with the grant with the grandparents. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the grandparent, you know, my grandma did a lot of raising of me. Yeah. She was a saint. She was like, you know, the kind of you hear the stories of Christian women that like during the depression were like baking pies for the hobos that they would, you know, they would leave out at night and, you know, a very long suffering Christian kind woman. Yeah. Um and you know, my mom was starting to work as a teacher and so on. And, but you know, one thing that they always were very, they were very, very good about was was education and and saying we're going to make sure you get really a, a top flight, you know, school to go to. Um, so I went to this school, and you know, you you mentioned Brett's novel uh, Less Than Zero. I mean, this this um, school in the eight, early eighties was kind of like a cheesy midwestern version of that kind of universe. Um, a lot of rich kids who were high. What I what I later learned about this school was that it was a sort of a dumping ground where they would put rich fucked up kids who who crashed the RV into a tree or something like that, where they would stall them out here to kind of keep them from bad influences. And and that's really what the school was. It was not like some academic super achieving place. It was really more about that. So but I bought into it and everybody bought into it. And one thing that they did do was they had a real, um, you know, they really pushed the kids to, to go to good schools. And they had each year one or two, now let's say one to three people went to very strong schools. So that was just in the water. Like people were all competing to try and, you know, try and get into a good place. And and to me, it's it, it just made sense because I was like, I want to get out of here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to. I don't want to sell tires at Montgomery Ward. I mean, yeah. there's there was nothing. There Montgomery was, Ward. Who yeah. remembers that? Is that a Midwest does any, thing? Does anybody remember that? Is, is, is that a Chicago? I'm aging myself as Gen X. Uh, I think it's no. I think it was. I think it was I remember the whole Montgomery country. Ward. You're not that much. It's like it. Sears Roebuck. People know yeah, Sears Roebuck. Montgomery Ward. Totally. I, but Montgomery Ward was, was just a chain. It was just a you know, Montgomery. department store chain. They low, but like kind of mid. You what know? is going on with but have you been into a department store recently? Have I? There is no one there. I went to there's like yeah. a Kohl's here. I accidentally stumbled in there. It is like a terrifying, empty horror. It's a horror yeah. show in there. There is no one in there. Well, I thought it was like kind of, what is what are these places doing? I, I, like, I don't know if you survive. I don't know if you saw this, but in her most recent album, uh Lana Del Rey has a has a, a line where she says something like if you really wanted a basic bitch, why didn't you get one at the Beverly Center or something like that? And I was like, the Beverly Center? I don't think there have been people in the Beverly Center since like uh, the Clinton administration. Like, I, I don't, I think that's been gone for yeah. a long time. All those places are like the West, I, I went to like the West, what was it called? Like Westwood? West, West Side Pavilion? Yeah, West Side Pavilion. Like, I worked at a place i know you like taking the train around la you and i have that in common but when i worked uh for the longhouse 
uh, in, in the marketing world, I had a job in Beverly Hills and I insisted on taking the train there because I was, you know, I wanted to like, I've been trying to replicate New York and LA that for 10 years and failing. And then it took me 10 years to realize like what you're supposed to do here. But anyway, I was, I was still trying to do that. And so I would take the train and then I would uh, like take a scooter, one of those e-scooters, like two no, more miles. Not. Yeah. Really? Two more miles. Yeah. So this whole thing would take me like an hour, but it was great. I'd read the, I'd read the paper. Um, anyway, it w- I would get off right by West side pavilion in whatever that it's like Rancho park, that, that oh, stop really? Rancho park. Yeah. yeah. And every now oh, Rancho like, park is where you walk up to West side pavilion. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. That stop there. So I would sure. get off there. So I would w- be in West side pavilion and that place, it was easy it was like there were like homeless people living in the bathroom this is a mall this is a mall that used to be like well also maybe you have some understanding of this there's a thing that they did there that strikes me as super weird which is the nicest movie theater at post post corona in la was the west side pavilion um there was a landmark theater in westwood that had half you know half the theater would be um marvel movies or whatever's the big you know super mario brothers or something and then the other half was art house movies and beautiful theaters be, you know well attended older audience but very you know respectful audience very nice did well one day the landlord came to the guy who ran landmark and said uh you know you guys are paying whatever 15,000 a month next month it's 30 oh, and in a week they were dead yeah d e d dead yeah. like gone and it was a doing healthy business, doing you know doing really well. And I look at that and I go, what's going on in that guy's mind? Does he think, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is going to suddenly take over this giant crypt that used to be a cool movie theater? Who's going to take that now? It's a hu- I mean, it's a huge amount of space. Yeah, yeah it's like yeah. a floor of a giant skyscraper. Yeah, I remember that theater. It's, I remember it's, it's that. Yeah, really that was a great nice theater. theater. That yeah. was a great theater. And they had the big restaurant, like right there. They next had downstairs, to it. they had this thing yeah. called the West Side Tavern, which was yeah. a nice restaurant. That died before the theater died. Yeah. Um, things like that just, pu- I mean, I just look at that and I'm like, what is this guy thinking? Like, what does he really think? It's a fucking landlord's man. <laughs> Who's going to come well, in? Well, because they, they get weird, like, money from. This is like the whole public private problem, right? And, it, you know, a lot of people hit me up and say, dude, you know, you're always calling these people communists. What you should really call them is fascist because fascism is when the public sector and the private sector meld together. Maybe you said that to me. Somebody said that to me recently. And it was like, stop calling them communists. Like you're talking about fascists because that's when the, the private and the public sector become one is, is fascism. I don't think that's really 100% true, but that's what's happening with these landlords. Like, they, for some reason, are incentivized to sit on these properties and not fill them. It's better for them to just sit on them and not fill them than it is for them to fill them with a uh, like a not ultra top of market, you know, Starbucks. All right. right. And so that's why all these places go closed. Because why, why does it make more money for them to do that? I think it's a combination of tax breaks. It's a combination of like weird loans and valuations. Like it's probably because if they don't have an actual tenant in there, they can say it's worth however much money on paper. Right, and right, then they right. can get cheaper loans from some bank if they're like, oh yeah, no, this place is really worth this. So everybody is pretending that their property is at 99 percentile of what it could be worth right because they're all okay with just camping on these properties and not actually renting them. I, I, wow. I don't know the actual numbers but it's definitely a problem so Everybody. does that explain also you know you heard about these uh the dark skyscrapers in yeah new york in new york yeah yeah same same, same thing yeah. Yeah, it's because it's like it's all valuations and like what you can do with these like cheap loans behind closed doors and stuff. Right. Yeah. So. So I guess that means that the 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 pull, the political pull of small business is really small next to the pull of those landlords wanting their tax. Well, because they all want a Starbucks. They all want to put somebody. It's like it's like me as a as a marketing guy. Like if I can get a big fat client. They're just going to spray money at me. 
without thinking about it. You know, it's like, it's, it's not their money. Right. Like they don't care. It's going to be some middle manager who's just like, Oh yeah, check, take $2,000 to do five minutes of work, you know, cause nobody's going to check on it. Right. So they all want that. They're all like, Oh, I want the Starbucks where nobody's going to care. And the money is just like free money versus a mom and pop. They're going to have to chase them for the rent. Everything's going to be a right, negotiation. Right, right. Yeah. So. But it's so puzzling. I mean, there's a, there was also, I don't know if you were here. Um, no, I'm sure you weren't here for this. Um, there was a great thing. that was like one of those, you know, I think they call it like the anchor of the neighborhood, you know, uh, on um, Preston Heights and, San, and Sunset in that little, um, that little mall, there was uh, Richard Branson had a flagship uh, Virgin mega store. And it was a place when, if you went to the movie theater or the sushi bar there, you go and, hang out there, you read a magazine, maybe you buy a, it's just you know, it's a long time ago, you buy a DVD or something like that, or buy a CD. But it was this Richard Branson world. It was two stories. They, I mean, they had clothes, they had all kinds of stuff and it was just sort of a fun place. And they got their, you know, rent raised, boom, they died. And for literally like 20 years, this giant behemoth on a, a major, major corner of Los Angeles is just like a tombstone. I mean, it's just been, people have kind of vaguely tried to put this and that in there and it always fails and it never works and it's just sort of a void. Yeah. And it just, I don't know, man. It just it's like, insane. Imagine being so evil as to destroy Amoeba. It's just like, how could you be so, like, you're that greedy that you're going to destroy Amoeba use it it's like what are you doing right right you know like like that that's providing so much character to that neighborhood and you know they're saying to themselves in their heads oh things change you know things change neighborhoods change and they're right they do but there's no reason but do they change it's like yeah yeah yeah, right it's like what are you really doing it's also weird i mean it's like those people i'm sure you read there's like a million articles about this like when the Lower East Side started gentrifying. Yeah. yeah and yeah. you'd have people who lit, you know, like some yupster, some Goldman Sachs yupster who lived on Ludlow Street, who was next to Katz's. And they'd be like, oh my God, this neighborhood smells like a pickle. <laughs> and you just go, why did you come to New York? Yeah. Right. What did you think New York would be? Right. Like you right. really thought New York would be like a mall in St. Louis? Yeah. Really? You Although I, I will say, I lived in the West Village. Uh, and I had this neighbor, this woman who would stay up till seven in the morning, sometimes like doing coke and, and like blasting music. And I did tell her to be quiet like several times. <laughs> because she probably was... worked with the chick who smelled the pickle. <laughs> yeah. Their yeah. cohorts. Yeah. Um, all right. So so um, you went to Yale and then what's the next step? The next step was I moved to the Lower East Side, which was at that time a hellhole it was crack city it was the summer of uh do the right thing people know that spike lee movie it was when all the craziness was going down in new york brown heights the end of ed koch the beginning of david dinkins Ninkins. Uh, so you never really hear about Ninkins. who was who was dinkins dinkins? I, david dinkins I mean you hear about i thought it was it was a coke or it's koch it's ed koch ed koch it's koch right yeah sorry coke I mean, the Koch brothers. Koch are the brothers. The both they're the brothers. The yeah. Koch is Ed. I mean, again, like I've only seen it written. I haven't seen people like talk no, Ed about Koch, Ed Koch. Ed Koch was a real character. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he was. He was a Jew. He was. He was a big Jew, yeah, but he was, he was also. Jew. He was. He was like kind of anti-black, I think. And <laughs> you know, things got sort of out of hand, and he was replaced by David Dinkins. Uh, who had a short tenure and, you know, um, he was a sort of a transitional, I guess, maybe you could say he was a transitional figure, but he kind of wasn't because then he was replaced by Giuliani. That's a whole other kettle of fish. But at that time I was still there. I was, I was in New York. Wait, so Giuliani came after Dickens? Dinkins. Really? So how yeah. long was Dinkins? I think Dinkins was one term. Which is what is one term for a mayor in New York? I think four years. So it was Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, and when Koch, did Gi- Dinkins, Giuliani, Bloomberg? And when did Giuliani take take it? Nineties. Uh, so it was pre pre nine eleven. Oh yeah, definitely pre nine eleven. Um, I don't remember how many terms. I think there was term limits on New York mayors. I think. I don't know if he had two. Um, we can Google all this shit, but I was there. 
for the end, I was there for like the last drops of the old toxic New York. So when I moved there, I was very broke. And I worked, this is no joke, I worked in a video store next door to Trump Tower. I had a lot of Trump Tower denizens who would come in to rent movies. Um, and I lived on the Lower East Side. You and, and Hadrian, both the video he, store. Hadrian that's works. his whole, that's his whole uh, genesis. I know he had, a, I know he had a video store. I didn't know he worked next to Trump Tower. Oh, no, 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 no. I just mean he's a gen, uh, video store. You guys are the video store cowboys. Well, you in Tarantino, you guys are the Tino archetypes, stores. king of <laughs> king of video stores. But uh, it was still, I mean, uh, uh, New York was still gnarly. Like when you walked out, I lived on Rivington and Clinton, and when you walked out of your front door in the morning, the the sidewalk was just peppered with the lids of crack vials, those like red, yellow, and blue lids. Like people were in just, Manhattan, like, candy. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, all the time, it was a total, it was a total nightmare. And it changed so quickly. It's very strange. I can't. I, I used to come back to my apartment. I put the key in the lock, and I'd look up at the at the you know these these fire escapes that, of these tenements, and I'd look at this and go, you know, this place was poor 150 years ago, and it's going to be poor 150 years from now. And you were wrong. You know, it. <laughs> right? And then five years later. I, I came back to do a play and I and I showed people the town the, the neighborhood and I was gonna take him to the mean streets where I live. And there was like a Betsy Johnson <laughs> and all this stuff. And there was like a W hotel. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, in my day, you couldn't you couldn't imagine that. You couldn't yeah. imagine it. It was a hellhole. I lived on H uh Houston and Attorney. Sure. Remember Attorney Street? Of course. One, one. Nice part east, of town. Was that east or west of B? Yeah. Yeah. There, yeah. No, that was my, uh, that was my spot. How long were you there for? I was in New York total for two years. Yeah. I was there for one. Yeah. So we both did it. Quite and then I came here. I came here to go to grad school. I had a brilliant friend. If people know this guy, he's a, a great uh, theater actor, won the Tony for best actor, Jeff Mays. And he came to yeah, UCLA. Jeff Mays. Jeff Mays. I don't Mays. know it's Jeff fantastic. Mays. I, I just did name. this movie called Seneca with John Malkovich. Where oh. Malkovich plays the Roman philosopher Seneca. And Jeff is the narrator of the movie. And he's the he gives the best performance in the movie. You never see him. He's just a voice for a narration. And he's incredible. Um, if anybody ever, you know, goes down the rabbit hole, go down the rabbit hole of Jeff Mays. He's amazing. Uh, but he called me and said, Matthew, there's this, you know, I'm going to this grad school. A lot of people from Yale have come here. And it's very avant-garde. They're into weird shit. They really like weirdness and interesting things. And I think you would really enjoy it here. And that was just music to my ears. I was, I, you know, I could see the path. I saw the path of people who were also in theater who who were grinding away for decades in New York and being paralegals and just grinding away at it. And I thought, oh, this is not for me. I, I want to do something else. So moved to California came to California in 1990 and uh went California to or LA went to San Diego first oh nice did uh my grad school in San Diego and then I started what directing theater UC San Diego UCSD UCSD in theater in theater you know my mother's a professor at UCSD no, in no. in theater no yeah what's his name <laughs> Kim Rubenstein Kim Rubenstein yeah I'm a fucking Jew half <laughs> <laughs> ask her if she's ask her if she's friends with Naomi Azuka. I'm sure, dude. She, I'm sure she is. It's I, like, yeah. She's a literal. What, she's what a professor her, of theater at UCSD. What professor? Of what kind of theater? She. I what do you mean? What kind of theater? She did undergrad. She was Acting, kind of writing, yeah. Like so what? directing. She's a director. She's a director. Yeah. I, I've been there. I. I. She. She got me a job teaching like uh, when I was really down and out. She got me a job teaching like um, scientists how to science communication courses there. Great. So I'm down there all the time, or I was really down there all the time. Yeah, um, it was great. It, yeah. it had a heyday. All that shit I was talking about my mom. She she actually that's not. I'm realizing it's you know for Jews we have to respect our parents. It's, Wait till it's you hard. see Bo is afraid. That's all I can <laughs> draw it back to Ari Aster. Um, wow, your mother is in the theater program of UC San Diego. And it's so funny you did Yale, and she was an artistic director at. At Long Wharf. So we have. It's all, place. it all comes together. We're all in the same place. Yeah. From Chicago. Wow. 
We're the same person. <laughs> That's why we're so bitter. That's why, uh, why we both like whiskey. So, yeah. <laughs> so I went. I did. I did UC San Diego, and then I started directing in theater around the country. Oh. And while this was going on, you know, I my first love was always movies, and I went back to that, and I got repped for, um, for for uh, writing for screenwriting. And I started writing for people. And the real turning point for me was I wrote for uh, Clive Barker. Do you know Clive Barker? The of course, Clive British Barker. horror guy. I'm absolutely. Who's Clive. a super, people don't know this, but Clive Barker is a super erudite, learned, learned man. He's like Peter Greenaway. He's like one of those, God knows everything about painting and literature and history and philosophy, everything about everything. He knows everything. Um, he just found a way to tell certain kinds of stories that made him lots and lots of money. And he owns a house in Hawaii and he's living his soul. He life. did a bunch of, did he do like a uh, white shark? No, 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 that's not Clive Barker. Clive Barker is uh, Hellraiser. Yeah, hell yeah, right, 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 right. Hellraiser. Hellraiser. But he has, I mean, I think the Clive real- Clive Barker's- Well, here's the thing. Clive Barker's cornerstone is he wrote something called The Books of Blood, which is an anthology series of short stories of horror. That is probably Stephen King would say this. If you dug up Edgar Allan Poe, he would say this. Probably the best anthology of horror short fiction ever made. Mm. And I think his whole career has basically been from the launch of that one perfect thing. That Wait, is just well, that. you're saying his horror was the best, the short? This book, which is not a thick book, but it's 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 a it's a really comprehensive collection of short stories. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, it's perfection. I mean, so, like so every like story is H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just gold. Everything in it is. Are you familiar with zero H.P. Lovecraft? I am familiar with zero H.P. Lovecraft. Yes, I've only I think maybe through you, I I I, I may have learned of him recently. Yeah, started following him. Are we? We're a super fan. No, I don't. I I shouldn't say anything because I, you know, it's I I don't dislike him at all. I just I really haven't read. It's like I can't say anything. Of, of H.P. Lovecraft? Yeah, I, no, no, no. I've read H.P. Lovecraft. Okay. I read Welbeck's treatise. I on read Welbeck's book, I, which was I, awesome. I read this book two years ago. It was sitting in Miami. I'll yeah. never forget it. I remember reading it in like a day, reading the Welbeck H.P. Lovecraft book, and going, "Wow, yes. this is incredible! So I can't cool. wait to read this." Then I went and read H.P. Lovecraft. It was fucking terrible. Absolutely fucking awful. You know what? I really know what you mean. I, I, when, yeah, when I actually read, not, we're talking about H.P., not zero H.P. Yeah. Yeah. The original H.P., it's like he does, you know, he, he's, uh, he's like our friend, Delicious Tacos. He will not be edited. He refuses to have an editor. Tacos is good with this, but he, he wouldn't let anybody touch his writing. Okay. By the way, I don't know if do people. I don't know if people know who that is. Probably, if you're listening to this, you know who oh, that guy is. You definitely is. know who Delicious Dog is. If you're listening, to this, I only you know. know <laughs> I know. I just know him. He was our first guest. I know him because of Red Scare. I don't know from anything else. But I started reading him, and they're really. Good. It kind of remind me a little bit of William T. Bowman. That's what everybody says. Oh, do they say that? Everyone's I'm sorry to be banal. I hate that. <laughs> that. Uh, do they I've never that? read so, Bowman. I've never read Bowman. But it's very engaging. But I was like, who? Who is this guy? What's his story? Who is he? Who's tacos? Yeah. What do you mean who is he? What do you mean say? Who is it? Is, is it just some guy funny. making this up who's who's just inventing all these tales or is it real? It's do you know who James Vanderbeek is? Of course. That's actually delicious tacos. No. <laughs> just kidding. Come on. <laughs> no, no. No, tacos is uh, you know, he's a, he's in my genuine opinion, I say this on every It's kind of a dumb he's, name. He's one of that? the best. He's one of the best. He's really a, he's a good fantastic, writer. fantastic writer. I mean, like just the craft of it, you know, the craft. Like Tacos, what I always say to myself is like Tacos wants to be a great artist. You know, he really wants to be a great artist. And he puts in the work. He's got the talent. Tacos is a genius. He's like a legitimate genius. You know, it's like you know, when you're around somebody who's like got an IQ of 180 and you can just kind of like tell that they're a billion times smarter than you and you're just like, okay, I'm here. Like he's one of the, <laughs> he's one of those guys that you're around that's like that. But anyway, he's a great writer. Really, really, really fantastic writer. But um, is it made up? What do you mean? Are the stories made up? Oh, no, no, no. It's definitely real. 
I mean, well, I mean, he writes fiction also, but. But when you read these things, they're like, oh, this girl blew me off and I did this, that, and the other. Oh, that's real. Oh, yeah. It's very real. It's very he's, real. Oh, yeah. He's totally a real. A real you no, know, it's not made up at all. Did you just turn this off? No, no. I just, I, I'm just making sure the screen doesn't. That's okay. It's like it doesn't. Um, <laughs> so, what, what is this guy's story? What's the story? What do you mean, what is the story? Who is he? Well, I can't tell you his identity. Why? Because what do you mean? I'm not going to dox him. No, I don't mean that. You don't have to be that specific. But, like, what's his basic, what's his shtick? What do you mean? What does that mean? Is he a is he a kid? Is he an old oh, man? No. Is he a no? He'll tell you no. Like, he'll he'll, he'll tell you his exact age. So I'm not doxing him at all. He's like 47. Okay. Yeah. So he's rich or poor. Um, he'll also tell you this. So he, you know, he um he's middle class, I would say, and you know he's uh, lives in an apartment not far away from here that I've been to, and you know he's a nerd. He's a nerd. He's a he's a gamer basically and a super genius and he's read every book you've ever wanted to read you know he's he's like half bukowski he's definitely like half bukowski but bukowski had more um gravitas uh tacos is like a bird man i always say he's a bird man he lives on a perch and he's shoots arrows and he's very like airy he's like an air guy he plays video games and he He's like a very, he loves shooting guns. You know, he's like an air person. And he's very high-minded. He's very like uh, okay. up here, you know. He, he's read everything you've ever read. Um, okay, this is very, he's an artist. very strong phrase. I've read his he's stuff and it was like an engage, it felt to me like an engaging block. Uh, a, I, well, you're describing Rambo, but uh, okay. Rambo. Rambo. Arthur Rambo. I, I you know, he was a poet. He wrote great poetry, the greatest poetry ever. And then at 24, he quit and became uh, a merchant in Africa. Just gave it up. So that's more like a Minaquinone 4 that you're talking about. Um, it's, Tacos is not a poet. Tacos is a is is a uh, craftsman of the word. That's what I will say. Like his prose is better than anybody. And everybody that we read uh, today, like all the guys in our scene, me included, I rip off Tacos all day. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't rip him off directly, but the way he structures his sentences, I definitely take that from him. You know, and they, he he has this way of uh, putting out all the. He'll go like full sentence with a subject and a clause and a whatever the fuck you call it, like a full sentence structure, and then he'll go one word sentence one word sentence one word sentence then another long sentence like i totally fucking i i totally take that from him kill that phone that's being your phone um i i uh i take you i take you at your word well read uh -huh. more of it read, read I've, no, I've, I've been reading it I've no reading so it. his reason he has look go to his blog and go to most read yeah. Great shit. Okay. Yeah. So here's a question. These, there are these, and you know, I am exposing my ignorance here for the people who are listening to this, who are youthful and hip. I'm old and toothless. So I'm just uh, uh, skating on the margins, but you have I teeth. do. I can see your teeth. I, well, I try. <laughs> I, I will just say, I wonder, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like where, where's literature at or where's philosophy when I think of like, you know, you, you mentioned Hadrian before, and I think of in Hadrian's movie, uh, Which that one? got the, what's it called? No, no, no GF, GF, what the fuck, no girlfriend or whatever the mm -hmm. fuck it's called. Um, this really interesting figure of Kantbot. Yeah, Kantbot. Kantbot, Kant right? Who is interesting for a lot of reasons, not least of which that his... Uh, influences are really interesting, especially you know contrasted to the main vein of what you the influences of the people who write for the New York Magazine or the New Republic or something like that. He's into all these things. Like he loves um, 18th century drama. He really knows Schiller well. He knows Schiller's Don Carlos intimately. Um, he he knows a lot of people. I guess are into this now, but sort of ancient philosophy. Uh, he's widely read in ways that I, to me, just the ch just the choices of what he is studying are really interesting. Um, not at all what you find in 
the books that are reviewed in the New York Times yeah. book review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At all. Um, Although Harper's did just review the new translation of Ernst Younger's On the Marble Cliffs, which was definitely a little nod towards us. You know, it yeah. was like a little bit like, we see you over there. You right. Know? Well, there are yeah. just nods, right? It yeah, there's Harper's little nods. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. little... Yeah, yeah. not little... Atlantic. Atlantic is totally... Didn't the Atlantic write something about Bath? Didn't they write some sort of, and it may be a little pearl clutching. I mean, you know, all these things are pay to play now. Atlantic is play, pay to play. The only things that are not pay to play anymore are Harper's, only because it's funded by what, the MacArthur's or whatever? It's like funded by, right. and then New Yorker, which New Yorker is maybe the only pro, like genuinely profitable magazine in, in the world. <laughs> you know, the probably. I mean, like, yeah. Vogue. Uh, but doesn't but, vote but, make but money off all its ads. Yeah, no, no, but, but that's all pay to play now. So, so what I'm saying is like a genuine thing that makes its money off selling the ideas right. and a, a few ads. You right. know, um, wow, that's really sad. So, cat people or cat, what, cat, cat people, person, cat people, cat, cat person, person, cat people, yeah, cat, yeah, that's not that's Schrader, right. cat people, no, cat person. <laughs> that's that's like winning the Olympics right now. Did you? That was read a New it? Yorker thing. That was New Yorker. Did you read it? Did. I liked it. Ugh. No, Delicious. you hated it. Of course, it was bad. It's it's like Me Tooism as a fiction. <laughs> it was like the official fiction of the Me Too movement. Atrocious, <laughs> abominable. Yeah. But I guess what? Yeah. But my question about about Kant Bot and people like him and maybe delicious taco spills in this category is: Are these like the literateurs and philosophers of our world, and are they sort of um, bound to exist in this world that's outside of what we consider, you know, like you're a writer, so you write a book and they publish a book and you read it and you, you know, and you sell the book. Yeah, of course, that's all over. Man. It's over. That's, oh, that's that's been over. But it's, that's, it, but oh, it's that's, so what wait. you're saying is it's it's not just economically over, it's it's culturally over. Yeah. Definitely. I find well, that well, sad because I, mean, I like, think what 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 book have they name one book? They they haven't published anything good in you know it's funny, like nobody ever actually puts him in this conversation, but Bourdain was actually the last guy before he was killed by Harvey Weinstein. Uh, <laughs> he was so here's you want to hear my Weinstein theory? So hmm. Bourdain pissed him off, killed in Europe. Uh same story with um wait there was somebody else who supposedly committed suicide in europe or no died in europe oh oh uh james gandolfini J oh come both on. of them and both of them feuded with weinstein and then both were found dead in europe for different reasons interesting yeah you think i think harvey still has the magic while he's in in rikers or wherever he is no, no no he was he was wasn't in rikers yet no i know but i'm saying right now oh no, no he could be like no oh absolutely no he no more but Brad did you, Pitt, you're dead. Did no. you ever see that? Did you, you never saw that amazing overnight celebrity or whatever about the guy who made that amazing documentary that was like taken off the internet about the guy who made um, Boondock Saints? Oh, of course, I know. Yeah, and I Harvey Weinstein sends the car after the guy to like run him over. I saw it. I saw that movie in the theater, and the makers were, were, were at the end. It was it was at the it was in the AFI fest. So at the end, the lights came up. And the filmmakers were terrified because they thought Troy Duffy was going to come <laughs> to the theater with a gun <laughs> yeah. and be like, fuck you guys. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, he's a terror. But I think he's, I think Troy Duffy's still. He's here. around. He's, he's, he's around. Us. He's yeah. still with us. He's among us. No, I, my, this is my craziest genuine. I genuinely believe this. I, I'm not just, I don't have any evidence besides speculation, but I genuinely believe Bourdain and Gandolfini were killed by Weinstein. I mean, look, it's Weinstein. What, 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 what is does Wein Harvey have to gain from killing her? Is Reed? Weinstein really not going to kill anyone? Weinstein has surely killed at least one person. Well, P.S. Aja was a foe of, of of Harvey. Exactly. But that's why he went after Bourdain. Because remember, Bourdain, that's the whole thing. He was, he was going after Harvey via Asia. Oh, Anthony was. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Harvey was already got by that point. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't already got. All right. Anyway. Well, this, well, this, leads, that's, this that's leads my us craziest. to... 
Well, this leads us to a larger okay. concept, yeah. <laughs> which is which relates to your text about Bud Light. Yes. And your essay about Bud Light. Now, hopefully, I, I assume you're going to just like tag that on this. Pop. No, I'm not going to tag that. This is my part. It's about you. It's not about. Well, I know, but um, so Isaac wrote an essay that I think was really interesting about the Bud Light kerfuffle, about Dylan McDermott or whatever is. Fucking what his name is? What's his name? Mulroney. Whatever. Mahoney. I don't even say. Dylan. It. What is it? What is I it? honestly don't even like to say it. I know. Well, okay. I don't well, know what it is. Call him, call call him Dylan. Is. Dylan's working for the man at Bud Light. So okay. So now here is something that we were talking about the other day over breakfast, which is, I think there is a um for 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 people to to mature. I think there's sort of a, a basic paradigm shift that needs to happen, and I don't know if it will, which is I think everyone, left does this too, but the right does it as well, and even the smart, whatever you want to call them, right, smarty pants, right people do this as well. There's a narrativization of things, and and I think it derives from the fact that pretty much everyone under 40 uh, learned the notion of storytelling from Marvel and Star Wars. So basically everything is black hats and white hats. Everything mm. is yep. a third act showdown uh, where, you know, a robot punches a skyscraper and, you know, hijinks ensue. And there are, there are protagonists and there are antagonists. Now, clearly in the SJW world, there's like antagonists galore and the evilest people in the world uh, proliferate. But in every version of this story, there is that. Um, the thing that I think is is so deeply horrifying is I think a lot of the trends that are making our world so incredibly dystopian are things that are what I would call organic processes. For instance, when I was a freshman, um, and I think we still have the word, we were just pottering on the edge of the word freshman when I was a freshman at Yale. Um, I had for a year, um, you had to you had to do a certain amount of non-Western culture, civilizations, whatever. So I said, I'm going to knock it all out with Professor Bell Hooks. And if people know this podcast, I don't know, you can look up Bell Hooks. Her name is Gloria Watkins. And um, I spent, I was just like a hick, rube ass schmo <laughs> from Illinois. And here I was plunked down in the middle of Bell Hooks. <laughs> now, you guys can discover on your own, like just go to YouTube and type in bell hooks and you'll get it, I think fairly quickly. But at that time, you know, bell hooks was still fringy. Um, the center was still like, you know, the canon of Western art. And, you know, one person who was brilliant while I was there was Harold Bloom, who jiggered with and changed and tinkered and had interesting perceptions of the Western canon, but it was still the Western canon. It was, it still was what it was. He would raise certain things up, bring certain things down, but it was still what it was. Bell Hooks, you were in another universe. Um, and Bell Hooks was what I think we now consider to be woke in embryo. And it was, you know, it was still a bit out of the norm. It was still not what you saw in the nightly news. It was not what you read in the New Yorker. It was a bit fringe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was a bit what they in the, in the day would call militant. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And yet, all the people who went through that class, you know, when I got into the 90s, you know, I was in grad school in the 90s and I saw TAs in the 90s and they had been dunked in bell hook sauce. So they were kind of spreading that kind of stuff. Here we are today, and that bell hook stuff is so the status quo. Yeah. Like, I don't know what you, you know, back when I was a kid, the status quo was like, you know, Strunken White's uh, uh, style book. Which is great, but Which is great. Which is great. fantastic. Oxford, I highly uh, recommend that. Re recommend that to everybody. I read it as an adult, Strunken White, and it is hilarious. It is. It's like, he's such an asshole. He is. He's like anybody who would say this is a complete savage, disgusting. <laughs> you know, it's like it's so good. But uh, so anyway, good. no, no, I'm following you. But all I'm saying is, you know, um, we talked about this the other day. I think there are all these people who, and in, in, including, you know, a lot of the smartest people I know who believe that, you know, well, really behind DEI is, you know, George Soros and blah, 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 or, you know, Bill Gates 
Bill Gates bought all this land before he wanted them to change it to this and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we talked about this, you know, if, if that were true, um, you know, you could uh, hire Jason Bourne to kill Bill Gates and then uh, all those problems would be solved. But of course they're not because it's not about him. It's not about George Soros. It's not about Gavin Newsom. It's, those are just, you know, minor figures. I think what is so dystopic is something that is a long-term process. It's a cultural process. It's a demographic process. It's something that I don't think that kind of um, good guys and bad guys narrative can address. So that's that's my thesis. Well, wait, but I, I don't fully understand. I, like, I understand what you said about we've all learned this black hat, white hat, Star Wars, good guys, bad guys, overcoming the evil thing, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that. Mm -hmm. And then I understand this other really good point you're making about bell hooks, but starting as the fringe and now having become the mainstream, which is very classic, uh, you know, because a lot what, of what do these ideologues, what do these ideologues do when they get into power? Right. They always fuck it up, whether it's Hitler, whether it's Stalin, whether it's uh, Gavin Newsom, they, they don't know what to do when they're not the rebel anymore. You know, once they're in control, whether it's Castro, have you ever been to Cuba? Really? Cuba is fucking horrible. I've been there. You go there. It I is... know right wingers who think it's fucking awesome. Well, maybe they're going to some interesting place where you can just do it in terms of, no, just in terms of the human emotion of the place, not the not the quality of life. Listen, you go to Cuba, try getting a Cuban sandwich. Mm -hmm. Does not exist. I'm a simple guy. I like to drink, dance, eat good food. None of it. There's no public. Everything's behind closed doors. Everything's shady and weird and poor. You go to a restaurant that's a good restaurant, they'll give you a can of beans, like a can of vegetables. Yeah. 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 It's, it's terrible. It's a terrible existence. It's, it's disgusting. Uh, dead it's dead you 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 think like uh oh go to cuba we're gonna have dancing and fun there is nothing havana is quiet there's there's nothing happening i'm sure that if you're a local there's probably some great party you know you can go to that's like but 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 as a person visiting there there's absolutely nothing you know there's there's no liveliness the, the museum's closed you show up the museum it's fucking closed. You show up at this monument, it's rotting. You try and go here. It's it's literally, it's a very sad, sad fucking place. Well, what to me, what I think the future of America is, is like, I mean, I I spent uh, a few years ago, I spent a, a week or so, 10 days or something uh, in India, which I love. I love India. I love the Indian people. I love Indian culture. But the thing that was so interesting about it, and you could feel it was sort of like a premonition of the U.S., was if you have money, and, and by that I mean, you know, you don't have to have a lot of money, but you have like, you're an American that comes there with with your with your roll in your pocket, you can stay in a fantastic hotel. You can have the most incredible meal of your life. You can swim in a swimming pool. But right, like literally, unlike in America right now, but it'll come right outside your door. When you walk outside of that six star hotel, there is literally a family living in a ditch that looks like it was carved yeah, by a yeah, 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 in the street. Yeah. Yeah. And they're in there and they're cooking animals on in fire yeah. that, that smokes up into the street. Yeah. And everyone lives with the coexistence of those two things. Yeah. There's the green zone, you know, if people yeah. know that from, from Iraq, where you're behind a wall and they got Burger King and there's guys with guns, you're going to be okay. It's like America for a while. Um, there's that. And then there's just hell you know, yeah. outside. And in India, the two coexist. And that's what I think America is going to be. If you have the dough, you're going to be able to live in some gated community or something or something. Yeah, we're Brazilification is what people right. and, 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 and just and going to extremes. Brazilification. Yeah. Too, <laughs> we're going to extremes, right? Right. Yes. All right. So, so let's, uh, we're, we'll, I, I don't know. We really don't have that much more time here. So, um, really? What? The, how long it's five. Doing? Well, shit. How much time do we have? How when have we been going? I think about? we should probably bugger off at five thirty. All right. Well, let's finish. Okay, we got thirty more minutes, so we need to get the rest of your story in here. The rest of my story. So bell hooks. We got you up to so bell, bell hooks. hooks. Okay. okay. So yeah. So bell hooks. 
Right. No. We, okay. So Bell Hooks, Harold Bloom, a lot of interesting people. Um, the great, great theater director Peter Sellers who yeah. came to uh, to our school and said, "Had a great idea." Who played the wheelchair guy in? That's Peter Sellers. This is Peter Sellers with an A. Oh, I've never even. He's heard a Los Angeles-based opera. Never even theater. heard of that guy. Great genius. One really? of the great living geniuses. And he said, "Listen." you guys, I know all of you folks want to do movies and it's going to take you a zillion years to get some rich guy to give you $5 million to make a movie. But in the meantime, you can make an incredible work of art with your friends out in front of this building that we're sitting in right now uh, with five folding chairs. You can do one of the greatest plays of all time. You do Hamlet with five cool actors, five chairs, stand in the street, do it. And that was an incredible challenge. And it really prompted me. That's how I got into theater was because it was like, wow, you could do some really, really cool things with nothing. You could just find some interesting space. You could find that tree over there in the parking lot and just seat the audience in, at the right angle to the tree and have a really interesting event going on. You yeah, this player. shit all just triggers me insanely because I, this is what I grew up with. So like my dad was in like cannibal cheerleaders on crack. I know it well. Yeah. So like I grew up in weird theater. But that's and I hate it. Kind of I hate it. Campy theater. I mean, I just hate it all. Like I I cannot watch theater. Okay. I okay. would rather do literally anything. All right. Let than me go to be, a play. Let me be your shrink for a minute. It, literally anything. I I, I hate into it. that. Why is it so painful? I have never gone to a play that I don't feel like I'm having daggers in my face the entire time. I it's, fucking it's boring. It. It's embarrassing. It's boring. It's cringy. It's cringy. I feel cringe for the actors. I feel like it's just fake. I'm bored. I can't tell what anybody's saying. Like I can't hear anybody really very well, you know? So it's not, I can't really digest the lines. You know, it's like, it's not like movies where I can like, remember the lines you know later but it, it's you know i just i would rather like I, I made a rule recently i'm never going to another theater production in my entire life i this is i'm a free i'm a free man i don't have to see theater i will never see another theater production i don't want to see anything ever again i'm i, I'm, I'm, I have to say honestly <laughs> i'm really sad I'm really i hate sad all of it I don't like the cult. I really, really, really don't like the culture of theater in America. And it's and, not the culture. It's oh, just I, I just I don't like the experience. But but again, it's probably some weird. It's not. It's probably some weird wrapped up because I love movies, right? I mean, it's, they're not that different. It's probably some weird traumatic some difference. It's probably some weird traumatic thing. You know? Okay, like, so what's your what's your, what is your relationship like to movies? Do you I like movies? Them on a laptop do you like movies no, in a movie no. theater uh, so i was in austin recently and i uh went to several parties was out all night woke up really fucking not feeling good and i was in austin so i went to the uh it was during south by southwest i went to the uh alamo draft house to see what was playing there will be blood one of, the greatest, <laughs> oh, one of the greatest movies dude, of all time. I sat there and I drank like a whiskey milkshake <laughs> and just watched There Will Be Blood. One of the best experiences of my life. Of course. Like I was so hungover, so down and out. And I was just like every moment of that movie, which I've seen like 10 times before. Like I was hanging on every moment. Like I was okay, not bored I... for one second. I was completely engaged for two and a half hours. And I fucking loved it. Like I was there for every second. Can I make brag of there will be blood thing yeah sure i saw my first uh film my director was with bill pullman who's yeah. a great 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 genius he's a fucking yeah. independence day and a, and a prince of a human being he's <laughs> a wonderful person isn't he and a dead? great actor. what isn't he dead is he dead no he's not dead he lives like oh, 10 minutes from here no he's great he's, he's dead he's kicking ass but i saw the movie with him and a friend of mine who was uh, uh his assistant to him on the movie that we had done together and we went to see um, There Will Be Blood when it was playing at the Vista, uh, which yep. people know. It's a it's coming Los back. Feliz. It's a famous Los Feliz uh, theater in L.A. And next door was a beautiful, I think it's I think it's dead now, right? Uh, the Good Luck Bar. 
Massacre is an old Chinese restaurant that was converted into a bar. Beautiful. Yeah, it there. was red, like mean yeah, streets. It was really beautiful. I never went to that bar though. But we went in there, me and the, and the and and Zoe and Pullman, after watching There Will Be Blood, and we sat and drank one after another after another after another <laughs> whiskeys. And Pullman and I talked to each other like Daniel played <laughs> you all night long. The entire night, we just, I'll have some peanuts, please, pass them over here. I'd like some ice with this drink. Uh, just talked in plain view all night long, which was just glorious. Like, I, don't, I was like, okay, I talked like plain view with Bill Pullman for an hour. I could just die happy now. This is, this is good enough for me. Love, love him. And love him as plain view. He could PTA could write another movie where Pullman plays his brother or something. Like it'd be great. Oh man, it's so good. The way what does he say when he goes uh when they ask him how much he goes like six six dollars? Or it's like six, like they say, like, how much will I get? One sixth. One sixth. <laughs> oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yes. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like, Thank you very much. Like he cuts them off right before they're done talking. You're like, like he goes, they go, how much will I get? He goes, one six. <laughs> Have you ever seen? Oh my god, you gotta post, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stitch this oh, to your pod. Oh god, the thing where he's doing oh, it's so good. Have it's you, so you ever, great seen, you ever seen the outtakes where he's he's playing with the little kid? No, they're no. sitting in a they're sitting in a fancy restaurant. And he brings the little kid back from the deaf school, and some of his enemies are taunting him, and he's playing with them, and, and he's just fucking with these guys. And he's like, oh, why don't you come over here and say that? How about that? You know, and he's really fucking with these guys. And then finally, they just roll out of film and they go, cut. And you just see Daniel turning to the little kid and going like, eh. you know? <laughs> he has this little like shrug, like, eh. <laughs> all right. But it's so funny that he just snapped right out of it like that. You know, he's like, eh. That's all I've it's got. so cute. I don't oh, know. I dude, that it. movie is so what a masterpiece. Good. I mean, dude, when he's getting slapped in that church, and he goes from and it's so funny. I mean, it's so it's obvious. Funny to bring, too. It's, it's hilarious. It's hilarious. This is what's missing. This yeah. is what Roy Ignationalist says. So Roy Ignationalist all the time says, you know what's missing from our scene is the humor. It's the humor. And this is why he puts all these ads, these joke ads, it's like Mad Magazine. He puts these Mad Magazine ads in his thing, Man's World, because it's hilarious. It's funny. We're missing this like humor. And that movie is so funny. Right. It's fucking hilarious when he goes after the people in the restaurants. When he goes, I will slit your throat in your fucking sleep. <laughs> it's fucking it's so the whole good. movie is just a riot. I mean, everything it's is fucking incredible. Everything man. It's like PTA. And then what is happening? Who? What is he doing? He's PTA. Genius. He's the greatest living oh, filmmaker. Uh, yeah, I agreed, obviously. But and now he's this, making this... Vineland, which is gonna be a masterpiece. But what is this most recent movie? It's terrible. What is Vineland? Finally, it's a novel by Thomas Pynchon. Oh, another one. Get the fuck. Oh, I think it's going to be great. It's, it's Leo and Joaquin. Oh. Vigo. No. Oh, well, Vigo I'm happy about. I don't want to see fucking Joaquin and anything else. I'm done, really? I'm done with Joaquin. He's one... Okay, I'll tell this. I'm done with Joaquin. I'll tell you listeners with... this. Fuck Joaquin. Late at the end of the year is coming Ridley Scott's Napoleon. Yeah. Which is probably of interest to many persons listening to this yeah, pod. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's fantastic. Ridley's too and old. Joaquin. He, he is, oh, he it's is great. Old. And Joaquin is great in it. He's great. He does the Joaquin lost shit. me when he bitched out. He bitched out. He bitched out, and the Oscars is apologizing. He bitched out. He bitched out. Right? Remember Wait, the Joker? No, after his incredibly good joke movie with Patrick Affleck, whatever that fucking guy's name is, Casey, Casey Affleck. Affleck. Wait, by the way, I love Kenneth Lonergan's. Uh, Film. Margaret. No, no. Kenneth Lonergan. It, Margaret. No, 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 no. The no, movie. his movie Margaret is no, great. No, uh, East Coast, Burn the House Down, oh, Kill Mar the Kids. Manchester yeah, Manchester. Kids. You didn't like that? Arthur Miller goes to the Jiffy Lube was my quote on that movie. Yeah, no. 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 That's like... You didn't like that. Michelle Williams. Stand. Michelle Williams. She's a oh. good... She's a good actress. She's in a new movie that's really good. She's in a new movie that's really good. <laughs> she's a good actress. Showing up. She's a good actress. Well, she sometimes is. No, I think Joaquin lost me, man. I think he lost me. And Joker, not that good. Oh, no. Yeah, not good. No. 
Um, I mean, and look, and if you're going to play second, okay, can I, can you're going to play second penalty. You're, you're, yeah. you're a young person, yeah, so sure, you sure. understand this. Um, there was some notion. I mean, I to me, Joker is just like a, a, a cut and paste of a bunch of of Scorsese, you know, images and yeah, memes no, and things. Really nothing. Whatever. Really but nothing. But somehow, I feel like there are these people on the right that think that Joker was some jump down, turn around, flip a backwards, you know, backflip kind of based thing. And I'm like, I, I don't, I just don't get it. It just doesn't seem that smart to me. No, it's not. It's not smart. It's not good. It's, it's, and it's, and it's, again, Joaquin to me is a second tier. He's a second tier guy. You know, he's not, a, he's not a first tier Who's first person. Tier? You know who I think is really first tier? I was actually talking about, did you watch Waco? I haven't seen it yet, dude. I just Waco saw the new, the new one. Looks good. Fantastic. With Shannon, yeah, with Shannon's in it. Yeah, and what's his name? Who's the main guy? The uh, Taylor? Rich. No, ta yeah, Taylor. Fucking what's his name? Taylor Kirsch. Taylor Kitsch. Taylor Kitsch. It plays Koresh. It plays Koresh. Wow. Fucking incredible. That Did is what. That is the best show made in the past ten years. Have you ever listened to Koresh's music? No. <laughs> no. It's sadly. Not bad. Yeah. Like you'll see it, you'll be like, it's not that you bad. You can see why he was banging on the yeah. chick. No, dude. It's kind of like George Bush's paintings. Yeah. Like they're, yeah. You're like, wow, George. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not not like, oh, you actually, you're, 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 you're like, wow, George. No, not too bad. <laughs> no, this, this show, it, it is so balanced. It's like Shannon plays the FBI, Kitch plays Koresh. It's like going back and forth. Nobody's sure what's right, but it comes down entirely against the government. In the end, oh, dude, I cannot. I it, oh, all of them. It. I cannot okay, believe they Janet fucking Reno's made a great this part. Who, who's yeah, it, that? it's somebody good. It should it's be Linda Hunt. It's somebody really good. I can't remember who it is, but it is. They they get Reno in there, and she's fucking awesome. It's really good. Is Bubba in there? Who's who? who? President Clinton? No, no. No. He's off screen. No, no, he's not in it. Yeah, no, he's not. Bummer. But Reno's in it. But it's all about Crush, and it's all about this group and and the, the drama. And they're fair about it, but they Crush is the star. Kitch is the star, dude. And it is sure. so fucking good. I can't believe they allowed it to be made. The, like you talked about season like two, the recent one. This one that just came out. Whatever. Just came out. Oh, no, okay. no, not to, it was like it came out like four years ago and then it was redone on, it was, they re put it on Netflix. No, it, right now there's a new season. Oh, there's, oh, no, there's another season of yeah. the same thing. It's called Waco the Aftermath. With fucking Kitsch? Uh, there's Koresh in it and there's Shannon. Oh, shit. Seriously? Oh, snap. Yes, it's out. I didn't even know that. Is it I didn't even know that. or Showtime or something? Well, Epic. I'm telling you, man, whoever greenlit this thing was asleep at the wheel because I, I'm telling you, this Waco is fucking good. And and the 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 intro thing is a is a monologue by Michael Shannon. Like it is fucking bomb. And Michael Shannon starts to like lose his faith halfway through. Like it, have it you ever, have you ever really... heard Michael Shannon doing that um, sorority chick's letter to the sorority? Yeah. I think I Where he talks about cunt punting. <laughs> it's, it's so good. It's so good. So what's the politics of okay. this Waco? It, it, the politics is 100% libertarian. Really? That's what I was so shocked. When I watched this, I was waiting for the ball to drop and for you know the black woman to become the star. Never happens. They, they even have what's his name in it who's like super woke uh who's the latino comedian he's in the pest oh oh like was yeah like was almost in it he's a bad guy really and yeah so somehow they got like was to play a bad you know like was almost woke deep down oh, he's, he's like, he knows woke. what's up no, he's woke as fuck. he knows what's up he's, <laughs> he's, he's like 60 he knows what's going on <laughs> so yeah no it's fantastic one, one of the best things that. i've seen in a long time but um I yeah i see that Okay, so here's my question to you. In American popular culture, we got 15 minutes. Who is um who is a person that you suspect of being secretly anti-woke who hasn't outed themselves yet? Secretly anti-woke. Not even secretly, but just not openly. 
Well, the thing you have to understand is that most of these people aren't thinking about it at all. Right. I mean, it's like that. Oh, I think everyone's thinking about it. No, they're not. Like, like, I don't agree with that because I have many friends, right? I, and a lot of these friends are in Hollywood and they're not bad people. They're just people who go with the flow. You know, they're, they're, they're just people who go with whatever the thing is of the day. A lot of people think this is the biggest thing about people like uh, people with brains that people without brains, you will never understand. People without brains think their instinct to do the thing that they're supposed to do is their brain. <laughs> right, 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 right. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, like they think they think, oh, my gut feeling that I'm not supposed to say the N-word. That's me being smart. Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know? And that's why they say to people like us, oh, if you say it, you're just being dumb. But they don't realize they're just being led like a well, sheep. It's incredible that we have to have this babyish thing where we can't. It's like we're talking it's to a dog. So, it's I, like, I, you I, know, if you've ever had a dog, you, you, you say, hey, did you bring home the C-H-I-C-K-E-N? Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you're or afraid a that the dog is going to hear that, uh, you know. I mean, it's like, really? You really Dude, talk like that? it really got to me when, you know, like, I grew up with all Black people, mostly white people. I had Black friends here. I've always been very entrenched in the Black community. And I don't, my idols growing up were Michael Jordan and Tupac, you know? My idols later were Kanye. I absolutely- Not me. I never was into any wigger things. Oh, I was a super wigger, yeah. No. I was the biggest wigger. You're a Gentile. We're not into yeah. that. No, I'm a no. Jew, so it's like, a, yeah. You and Brett Ratner can take yeah. it. <laughs> we can take the fuck out. <laughs> we can take the wigger thing. No, but I was in the car with my friend here. And, you know, we became, he's from Chicago, but we became friends when we were older. And, you know, it's like, this creeps into your mind and you can't say the word. When I was younger, I could say the word. We were rapping with my friends. I would always say the word. Now they, the fucking communists or whatever you want to call them, totalitarians, they get in your mind so much that now they separate you from your friend. You're sitting in the car. You got to worry about saying the word. Fucked up, dude. And this is why I will hate them and fight them until I'm dead. Because anybody controlling your speech like that is wrong, 100%. Like, no, no one should be telling you what you can say. The words you can utter out of your mouth, fuck that. Well, I don't know what you think about this, but my feeling is the solution for me, per and maybe this is a way to wrap things up. The solution for me personally not societally, not as some kind of a rallying cry, but just as a person, is to get out, as Jordan Peele once said, and go to a place where this stuff is less um, oppressive and and just keep on moving and keep going to places that are less oppressive and and do your work, you know, as is. I don't feel like stand, like standing here in you know, standing in downtown LA and, and fighting is going to do it because it just seems like a losing proposition to me. I think go to a place where you are going to be less personally aggrieved and do your work, do your thing, make what you, you know, make what is meaningful to you and escape that stuff rather than get into it and smash up against it day after day after day. Cause I just, I don't see um I don't see a victory there. I see at best a draw. Of course there will be a victory. Listen, listen. Not for us though. Yes, there will. And and you you want you want to know why? The communists, right? Let's take the communists or the fascists, either one. You know, the the fascists is in the the Italians <clears throat> or the or the Germans. They all uh you look at what happened in you know, rise of the rise and fall of the third Reich. You know, you read that book; it's a fantastic book. You know it well. You look what William he, Shirer, yeah, a lost talent. People lost don't talent. know him. Where anymore. is he? Yeah. You look what happened with the rise of Hitler. It they racialized everything. They ideologized everything, and it, it wasn't just it didn't become it wasn't physics anymore. It was white physics. It wasn't art anymore. It was non-degenerate art. You know, right. it was 
they tried to paint over reality with ideology, you know, and it fucking failed. The exact same thing happened in the Soviet Union. They tried to be like, oh, we are going to be the people. Read Orwell, dude. Orwell is the master of this. Animal Farm. You know, we're going to erase history and make it all so that everything has always been a class struggle. And the poor people are going to finally be in control. And we're going to own the means of production. And it's going to be a beautiful utopia where the workers finally own the means of production. And we're going to do it. Blah, blah, blah. And what happened? It completely fucking failed <laughs> because it's bullshit. It's fucking bullshit. It doesn't work. The, the, the whole notion is completely fake and, and stupid. Well, here's the thing, though. I mean, I think right now. And they're going to fail, too. These people now, the, the people now who are doing this whole, like, reverse McCarthyism and communist scare, no one believes in this shit. You want to believe in oh, racial wait, wait, equality? Wait. You want to believe in racial, racial equality? Fine. Right? You go to Africa, there are black people. You go to Africa, are there men dressing up as women? Are there gay people everywhere? Are there women in fucking running the shit? No, absolutely not. And this is the whole thing. It's it's they're trying to force a reality that the entire world does not believe. And that was where the Nazis failed, and that was where the communists failed. Okay, well, here's here's my thing about that. I think, like, for instance, um, you know, people. A lot of people's minds were blown by, and now it's, I guess, sort of a political football, but libs of TikTok, right? Was something where, I mean, and to me, it was incredible and hilarious. What a sign of our times that this woman just literally reposted things that other people yep, posted yep. With, with generally, at least at first. With no comment. Yeah. There's just no comment. this is what she's like, like. Well, here it is. Here's what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was no comment. And people would write this hate speech, this abs anti LGBT, blah blah blah. And it was like, she's just she's literally just retweeting. Posted. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the thing that bugged me about that was, you know, here you have this word, right? Libs of TikTok, and I live in Santa Monica, okay, so I know libs. Libs are yes, they are. They have that sign in front of their house that says, "We believe in science. science. Love is love." Blah blah blah. The vaccine is groovy, whatever. Um, those are libs. Howard Dean is a lib, okay? Um, you know, Judd Apatow is a lib. These aren't libs. These are some people in another mental health universe that are in another world that doesn't have anything to do with Karl Marx. You know, it's like something that always bugs me is um, Jordan Peterson uses this phrase, cultural Marxism, which I always think is really dumb. It's like saying cultural Darwinism or cultural Einsteinism. There is no cultural Marxism. Karl Marx was an economist. He was someone who I think characterized very well. He didn't have good solutions to it, but he drew a good picture of the economic and political conditions of his day. He was a diagnostician. He was actually very good at that. He, what he recommended for it was not so good, but he, that's what he was. There is no such thing as cultural Marxism. It's it's a it's a misnomer. It's just something that sounds good that somehow pleases the folks. Well, but how do you not? Uh, okay, well, I would disagree in the sense that I've read the Communist Manifesto. I've read Marx. You know what Marx's first fucking thing, entire thing is is uh, escaping Jewishness. Sure. By the way, he's a Michelin, and his whole thing is Jews need to get away from Jewishness. <laughs> Sure. So anyway, Marx is uh, super, and if in today's world, he would be absolutely anti-Semitic in every way. Sure. <clears throat> what people mean by bio-Leninism, right? Bio-Leninism or uh, race Marxism or all these things, they mean in- I've never heard this before. Yeah, this is James Lindsay. You're too advanced for no, me. No, 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 yeah. James Lindsay. I, I've never even read this, but I know what his point. James Lindsay is this guy who's become known for this. So what? There's like a Steve Saylor kind of. Yeah. Well, Saylor is a race realist. Lindsay is. I like I Saylor. Know, I like Saylor too. I've met him. He likes all my comments, so yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah, dude, he's cool. Saylor, you met him. Saylor's from cool. Yeah, I met him. I, I imagine he's just like a, a regular Joe. He's like six six. No, oh, yeah, he's huge. Six six. Yeah, he's big. Uh. Very tall, but not fat, but skinny. And somebody told me that he was gay, and I believed it for a long time. He's, he's not. No, he's not gay. Yeah, I know. I was wrong. 
Uh, no. But he's like a square guy, right? Like, it's not very like square. Not oh, no, no, no. Like very, square very square, like, yeah, very calm guy. And uh, he, uh, anyway, all these guys, what they say is, I think basically the notion of biolinism or, or biological Marxism is the same thing that they were wanting to do with the classes. Like, so if you've read Animal Farm, you know, it's all about the, uh, you know, two, two legs bad or four legs good, two legs bad, right? It's the worker is good. The, the lower is good. The higher is bad, right. right? No matter what it is. And then the lower becomes the higher. And what happens in the end of Animal Farm? The pigs start walking on two feet, <laughs> you know, because then okay, they, they, they become the upper and, and they never- But wait, so you, okay, I think you've touched on something very important, which is, the identitarianism of now, it really is about some. Now, now here's something I think probably your listeners will hate this. Um, I think, let's say, first term Obama, the intention was that all this kind of, di you know, all this disparate human mass was going to come together around a table. We were going to come together around a table. Like one thing that Obama did that people laugh like hell at now that I still think was a good idea was when Henry Louis Gates got pinched going into his own house by some cop that, uh, you know, Obama had this ridiculous beer summit with Henry Louis Gates and the cop and Sleepy Joe and himself sitting around with beers. And it you look at it now and you go, oh, I, you know, cringe. But in a way, it was kind of right because he kind of served all the masters, right? Like he didn't let this thing slip. But he also didn't appear like he was wagging his finger at the whites and coming down on them and slapping them. It was something where everybody came together and it was a teachable moment and you know what have you. So there was a notion of we're going to share, we're going to blend, we're going to come together, we're going to have you know the the seats at the table are going to get expanded, but it's going to be the table. Then now it is about something very different, which is it's about reversing the poles. It's about reversing the poles. It's having the same hierarchy, but now the hierarchy is reversed. So if you are white slash it's straight perfect slash male, two, four legs good, two legs bad. Right. It's exactly so, what we're So it's the same said. thing. Yeah, you're just, just reversed. You exactly. just took the characters and and like yes. flipped them upside down and went. Like you got to reread Animal Farm, man. This is exactly what okay. Animal Farm is about. This okay. is the exact same thing. Okay. Now that said, I don't know that that is an ideological thing. No, I it's think not. it's a it's a, power it's, a thing. it's a it's a narcissistic. I think all this shit stems from it's a narcissism and smartphones. That's why I think everything of this comes from. I don't think it's ideological. I don't think these people are ideologically based. To me, it's always hilarious because I hate I hate like nerd culture so much that like all these people like Tina Heasy Coates and Roxanne Gay and people like that are paid millions and millions of dollars by Marvel Comics to do shit for them. Right. I'm sure Tina Heasy Coates and, and Roxanne Gay couldn't sit through a John Cassavetes movie if you paid them <laughs> or a Fellini movie or a Bergman movie because it's too much white bourgeois domesticity. But they love Marvel. Right. And they love money. These wokesters are super fucking greedy. They love shekels. They are absolute capitalists yeah but their patrons are saying what their patrons are saying to themselves is well this is how it's been forever you know john fonte got drawn up to hollywood and got paid however many dollars to do absolutely nothing you, you know you've got you've read uh not what's the one he wrote in his later years john fonte uh uh, uh ask the dust and but then, then uh, later it was I can't something bandino remember. Uh, no, Arturo Bandini. Yeah, Bandini. No, but uh, Bandino, Bandini. Whatever. There was some thing he. So you know, he wrote the three great novels, and then he didn't write another one. He lost his legs. He wrote one before he died, and that was about him coming to Hollywood, trying to write screenplays. He got paid to do nothing. They literally paid him to do nothing, and then he got in trouble because he kept asking. Like, yeah, but this something? is not about that, that. That's what they are. No, they've no, they love, done. they love, they love the ethos. They've Marvel always paid this... us off. They've always paid the writers off. So what they're thinking in their minds is we're paying off the, you know, <coughs> the, the, high, the high art. Their... Let me <laughs> just say this. Stuff. The high art tradition of the 20th century of European culture is individualistic. 
yeah um domestic yeah. bourgeois and psychological and these people hate all those things they want it to be multicultural team movies of people shooting rays with their palms out at each the, other the little girl has all the power yeah the little girl <laughs> has all the power. um which i find revolting it's anti-art i mean like there's nothing more anti-art than that that is to me the living end yeah um but is it ideological i don't know i think it's just narcissistic don't That's disagree no narcissism. don't disagree all right well we gotta end this so where where can people find you where can people find me? You can find me on, I think it's private, I hope, but you can you can um, tap on my shoulder on Instagram at Jorge Luis Borges, H-O-R-H-A-Y-L-O-U-I-S-E-B-O-R-H-A-Z-E uh, and on Instagram. And I will uh, befriend you there and fill you with delights if you come and knock on my door. That sounded like a Georgian, like... Mishka de vase. Mish- <laughs> this smell of pomegranate. <laughs> they love find it. Me. Okay, so we're now. Can, the we just, again, guys. can we just tell the audience <laughs> that we're going to see two films by some supposedly based? They're not based. Red pilled filmmaker. They're named not based. Betsy or... Brown. Is, yeah. <laughs> Betsy Brown and her twin is it? And her twin? brother, Peter. Back. back yeah who we've we've i've had asher You've, penn you, have you had asher penn has been on the spot has he yeah so what did he talk about uh his delicious tacos movie starring peter back he's adapting one of delicious tacos stories. you don't know this i don't know shit oh yeah dude really yeah. It's that's out? why i had him on is it coming out but yeah i mean we funded it it got funded he did a kickstarter it's for a delicious tacos short story starring Peter Beck. That's what. That's why we you did it. a go. You did a GoFundMe. No, no, he that? did. He did. But I had oh. him on to promote it, and then it it got funded largely because of me, but actually mostly because of Curtis Yarvin. <laughs> but I'll take credit. How much was it? Twenty grand. That's it. Yeah. Well, it was, like, it was supposed to be a short, but now maybe they're making it long, or a full. Holy smokes! Well, yeah. it's too late. I'll show you the trailer. It's too late there. to invite. I'll our listeners to come see this movie tonight. No, yeah, they but won't see they should go weeks. to La Gondola on Wilshire La Gondola, and kosher, and have some kosher Italian. It's great. I go there a lot. It's fucking fantastic. That place. It's it's like it's like Goodfellas. That place is like pure Goodfellas. It's like the Hasidim crashing yeah. into Henry Hill. Yes, dude. Well, the, the the Hasidim are Henry Hill today. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're done. We're done.